My name is Natasha Luck and we're here today at Thorn Apartments Jeff Cade Way to and the date is Friday the 31st of July 2015. I'm here today with the granddaughter of photographer William Whiffin and um, the interview is really going to focus um, on um, William Whiffin, his life and work, and his granddaughter's relationship with him, and also how this relationship has then really led us on to the upcoming William Whiffin Photography Exhibition at Tara Hamlet's Local History Library and Archives. Okay, um, Helen, just for the record, would you mind stating your full name and date and place of birth, please? Yes, I'm Helen Elizabeth Martin, I was born on the 2nd of September 1956 at a place called Bushy, which is in Hertfordshire. That's great. Um, perhaps you'd like to begin the interview um, by telling me a bit more about where you were born, um, about your early kind of family life and um, memories about growing up. Yes, um, we lived in Stanmore, which is in Middlesex, which is just um, about five miles away from bushy and um, there was my mother Ella who was the daughter of William Whiffin my father is Sid and I had a sister called Linda and um, we had a three-bedroom semi-detached house in a sort of suburban cul-de-sac um, I went to school locally and always walked to school um, and then um, Later, I um, got a job at the BBC, so I used to commute into London um, for many, many years. And um, what job did you do at the BBC? I worked in press and publicity at the BBC, so I publicised programmes, radio and television programmes, and um, I also spent a lot of time in the, the BBC press office dealing with all the sort of controversies and announcements that the BBC made so it was a fairly hectic job it wasn't nine to five um, very long hours and, and quite intense. Did you enjoy that job? Yes very much so you were sort of at the centre of things and the, the, the strange thing is now you thought everything was a, a massive issue for um, you know in the in the country but when you get uh, sort of uh, separated from it you realise actually that it's a um, it's not really. <laughs> um, and what kind of led you into that particular career? Can you point to maybe was there certain subjects you studied at school or interests that you had? Or? Not particularly. I suppose it was um, it because it well. I suppose it was because it was part in the arts. It was a, a creative industry, um, and. Uh, Mainly, I think, there were three of us from the, the the secondary school we went to who all applied for the BBC and actually all got taken on. And the BBC at that time did a um, secretarial training course for about 15 weeks. They taught you um, uh, typing and T-line shorthand. So we were trained up by the BBC and then placed in jobs. It was much easier, I think, in those days <laughs> to get work. And... Uh, the other two girls uh, eventually moved on, but but all of us went into the publicity area. I suppose it was it was it was interesting. You could you know you dealt with quite high um, you know difficult issues, but also it was you know quite nice. You met lots of sort of celebrities and and other people like authors and other things like that. So it's the best of both worlds, and it's quite interesting dealing with the the national press. It uh, can be quite tricksy, especially people like from the News of the World um, or The Sun. But, but again, you know, just very, very interesting. And um, thinking a bit again about your grandfather, yes. would you like to talk a bit about your memories of him and um, just anything that yep. kind of springs to mind, really? Well, I suppose, unfortunately, I I don't have any memories. I was far too young. I think I he died a f 14 months after I was born. So he he knew me, and I have I've seen pictures of him holding me, but I don't I don't recall him as a person. So all my memories really are from other members of the family, like my mother or my auntie Gladys, and or my uncle Sid, who were you know his 
um, daughters and son. And the impression I've always had is that he was a mild mannered man. He was um, very ready and willing to help people out. Um, and one thing my mother always said is that he, he used to do jobs for no money, just that he he did them as favours or he just felt it was useful for people or they couldn't afford things. So whether he was very good on the business side of it, I'm, ne I'm never really sure. I don't think they made, from their photography studios and businesses, I don't think they made a lot of money, obviously presumably enough to, to live on. And um, other things I know about him, my uncle Sid recalled um, going out with him so apart f you know to take photographs when he had time off so apart from work on the studio which he did his commercial business um, and obviously he took pictures when they went on trips or holidays one thing that that comes across is that he was he was just passionately interested in old buildings and we have so many pictures of buildings that presumably are not there now and I think some of that he knew he knew instinctively that that time was passing and these buildings you know were falling down or wouldn't wouldn't exist anymore so he made a record of them and he I think that's one thing he was quite proud of that he was a photographer of record not only in East London but he went round the country or certain sections of the country and took pictures of windmills of stocks of um, old barns anything that sort of took his interest again it could be just part of the countryside but but a lot of it was buildings um, and he he wanted to record them before they passed you know they passed on some of that I, I think from from correspondence I've seen he acted as a sort of stock photographer so if publications books or magazines or, or papers that sort of thing came on and said you know we're looking to do an article on x and then he might have pictures of you know certain things in in kent or in sussex or um, essex that he'd taken or they might do a series of say you know old the old windmills or the old stocks and again he could supply that to them so i think he had a, a, a you know an eye to that as well that it might be commercially you know advantageous to have these pictures um he took he i i assume as well it's something i don't really know but i've seen a letter to say we went out with the whiffins in 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 a car but whether he owned a car i was never sure but but considering he may have done um he you know they used to then drive to various places you know outside of of london to take pictures of things that had caught his interest. I think he collected lots of books and he probably saw or read articles and then he made notes in little notebooks about things that might, you know, might be of interesting to photograph. And so when he went out to Essex or to somewhere, he then managed to, to take pictures of all these things. But what my uncle had talked about was that, say, on a Sunday um, when they weren't working in the studio, they used to take the early um, buses into parts of London, uh, Sid used to go with him as a boy, and help carry his cameras because obviously the other thing we forget nowadays is that they were very big um, cameras with their tripods, with all the plates, the glass plates they had to carry about and all the other sort of equipment. And he used to lug this. <laughs> which is no doubt why he took my uncle Sid to help him carry um, they used to go to different parts of London and again things that he'd read about or he was interested in or I think he just explored you know if he saw um, things on buildings or plaques then he used to then take pictures of, of things that interested him and other things like um, houses where writers had lived or artists again a series of you know it could be Thackeray or it could be whatever uh, or that he'd read about that someone you know somebody had, had used to live there um, even if it wasn't sort of labelled as such so Sid went out with him and I've seen there's a couple I think one in um, the Bank of England where Sid is in between the columns so again William Whiffin used him as a sort of <laughs> 
a point of interest in the pictures, but I'm not sure that Sid, any of the family actually really liked having their photo taken, which people are like today. But I know my mother didn't. She wasn't re really keen on having her picture taken. Uh, but he he used again as a you know a, a point of interest to put to put children in the pictures or or people going about their day to day business. And um, what age um, um, would Sid have been? And do you know kind of roughly what period that would have been? Kind of roughly what? I think Sid was born in 19, 1917. So he it was probably the early twenties, which I think when William Whiffin was at his height, really taking pictures. He was then about in his 40s, because he was born in 1878, so he would have been mid-40s. Mm -hmm. And um, the pictures I've seen with Sid, is he's, he's sometimes dressed as a schoolboy as well, so presumably he was sort of, I don't know, you know, eight, about eight or whatever. But he does remember, and I think he, you know, he used to get on very well with his father and enjoy going out and exploring. So, and they there's a record that they've... Um, they turned up at uh, uh, one of these stalls for tea and coffee after they'd been out very early in the morning and they heard about the, um, out there, obviously people were chatting, and they heard about the the um, 101 disaster when the airship had um, crashed. And then uh, he also talks about, Sid talks about William Whiffin um, going along to, to photograph when the... Um, the, the you know when the bodies had been found or something I don't know what his connection to that was and he also Sid also refers to um, that uh, as William was a photographer he he went to the um, uh, Remembrance Day service at the Cenotaph or near there and whether he was part of the press um, you know um, plan or something that they 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 put you in press pen sorry they put you in. Uh, but he had a sort of, you know, ringside view of the goings on there, the ceremony. And one th one thing I do re recall people saying is, I think um, my auntie Gladys, his his daughter, said, he he re was really quite desperately keen to be a press photographer. He would have really liked to have been a press photographer. Why he wasn't full time, I don't know. I have seen letters where he did apply. Uh, to people um, for jobs, and he did do work for the newspapers. He worked for the, you know, Daily Sketch or the Mirror, and um, you know other other publications like that. He sent off pictures to the national papers, but whether he didn't really want to take that step, or whether they just purely didn't want him, I don't know. You know, I don't know that. But he was very interested in doing that, in doing that. So he ended up doing, you know local photographers photographs taking weddings street parties um he was always being art he, he worked for the council he worked for the port of london authority so that was um popular borough council yes that he worked for, yes it? he did so i have letters where they're asking him to take pictures or or paying him for them so there's a record of that he also seemed to do photographs for millwall football club um, and I've also seen that he did pictures for Queen's Park Rangers. So um, it's quite a wide variety of, of, of photographic work that he did. But I suppose in those days you called on the services of a professional because people didn't necessarily have their own cameras or now iPhones and uh, can take instant pictures themselves. Amongst the records of popular Methodist church, there's a note that... Um, many of the photographs that they used in their publicity materials, their publications and so forth, um, had been donated by William Whiffin. Um, do you know much about his relationship with the Methodist Church and his, uh, his desire to support them in that way? My understanding is, all, all my family, myself included, are Methodists um, um, and all attended um, church. I did as a younger child. Um, I don't go so much today. But um, his association with the church, I think, was from quite an early period. I have seen something where I can't quite remember the date. It must be in the sort of early 1900s, where my grandmother, his wife, my grandmother, Minnie Whiffin, 
was welcomed into the church so seems to have made i don't know what she what denomination she was before but seems to have made a conscious decision to become a member of the methodist church but it my understanding is their association with the methodist church goes back a, a very long way they also when they were lived at east india dock road at various addresses and then they moved um to Woodstock Terrace around the corner where the Methodist Church the modern Methodist Church was built on that corner and I remember as a child I used to stay with my auntie Gladys in Woodstock Terrace what seemed to me quite a, quite a you know a lot you know a lot whether my parents wanted a, <laughs> a break from me I don't know but I seemed to go there quite a lot and um, I remember going into the Methodist Church and it was always through the side door, which was on Woodstock Terrace, never through the front entrance, but the side door that went in and there was like the Chiropody Clinic. And to me as a child, that was very spooky and very strange. There were sort of curtains across, I remember that. Um, and they, I think they used it for storage. But my auntie Gladys, um, I think was a member nearly all her life, would have been all her life. And she, she and the other Whiffins were very heavily involved in everything that went on in the church. My auntie did the flower arranging, I think was a member of the guild. But I think William Whiffin, um, with his membership of the church, he wanted, he wanted to give something back. So he would have done, you know, whatever they wanted for him, uh, for them. Um, and he, he documented, you know, lots of things for the church because that's why there's so many pictures um, inside and outside um, and anything they went on outings I think quite a lot so he, he was called to do pictures of that um, one other thing I know about him is um, and I have recently found the sort of um, the document he took the pledge at a very early age which for people who don't know what that is it, it means you you sign up to abstain from drinking alcohol and my understanding is um, I think he was quite a young man and he never did drink for the rest of his life and one thing I also heard was he did find it quite difficult that when they went um, had some of these events or went off on these trips you know lots of people like to partake of a drink but but he he just didn't so he was the sane sober one <laughs> during these jolly occasions. So he was quite a disciplined person by the signs of well, presumably, but I, I I think I suppose he'd signed and he, he kept to that, yes. And that's quite interesting because a lot of the photographs I mean we've got many, many photographs by William Whiff in, in our collections at uh, Tower Hamlet's local history library and archives. And um, because we do have photographs arranged by subject, we've a lot of photographs of pubs. And I know mm. that some of the best photographs of pubs in the Poplar area are by William Weapon, so um, it wasn't that, you know, he didn't have a problem with no. photographing. He was actively interested in that. I don't, no, I don't think, he, I mean, it's just his, it was a, what we call now a lifestyle decision. I think he, he, he why that happened or who suggested it or whether he wanted it, I don't know the background to it. But it, I think it wasn't that he didn't go into pubs or didn't like them or anything like that. He just had, had taken the decision not, not to drink. So, And maybe that was part of being a Methodist. I don't know. We're not meant to gamble either, but <laughs> we do. Um, so I think, again, it, you know, his overriding interest would have been that it was, you know, interesting to document or to the life of the East End and... and again old buildings and I think when they were in um, when they lived in East India Dock Road at one stage they were opposite the Eagle Tavern which I think got bombed in the war as well but but so he's got pictures from outside his he used to take pictures from um, the window of his studios on East India Dock Road because obviously a lot of life was going on mm. and some significant events took place so uh, when they had the um, marches about the um, uh, popular rates, uh, when they had, you know, unemployment and other things, and people were obviously that was a main thoroughfare, and people, you know, lots of people gathered there. Um, and uh, you know, he took photos of that because they're, the angle they're at, they're, you can tell they're from an upper window, so he had a prime position. But it's also other things caught his eye, you know, when big, big 
trucks broke down or something and children gathered around or whatever like that things caught his eye I think you know he I was going to say whip his camera out but it was not so simple you set your camera up presumably then it wasn't, it wasn't so portable um, from what I've kind of learnt about William Whiff and just from our collections it seems to me that photography was a passion for him as well as a career and something a business and something that he should go on um, what is your kind of understanding from the family perspective from family members from what they've told you is that this would you get the same impression that... yes I would I think he I think it's shown by the fact that <coughs> he he took photos all the time um, and as I say it wasn't that he could just have a camera in his pocket so it, it, was, it was a sort of conscious effort to to take these pictures but he seemed to take them when they went out on family trips um, when they uh, you know he uh, he took family pictures but he also then still took other scenes or buildings and that sort of thing so he did he did the, you know instead of just thinking oh it's your day job and then not really wanting to carry on take pictures he he literally seemed to take pictures all the time and the amount that that we've still got um and i know that the library has got you know hundreds and hundreds and and knowing that a lot of his material was destroyed in bombing during the war you just makes you wonder how much there was to begin with there must have been thousands and thousands of of glass negatives um which need you know had to be stored but he you know, he he took pictures of all different sort of life that was going on in the East End, and um, he seemed to just want to document and be interested in in anything that was going on. I and mean, one other aspect of him, which probably as as he was born in Victorian times, it was quite normal, but he seemed to collect everything he was not a discerning collector i think he was fascinated by archaeology by geology by um in natural history by books um art definitely i mean he had an artistic bent obviously but um when they when they started out their studios he they were very keen to be known as photographic artists in those days and I think, you know, it wasn't seen as just um, a commercial thing. It was that you were so, somehow artistic. And and as far as I know, he, he did paint and he did um, draw. But it's difficult to tell from, from the things that are left because he, he didn't always sign things, but he, he wrote his name on them. So um, I think he did have that artistic bent. But he, he was just fascinated by anything and everything. And I suppose... Then they learnt about things in books. You learnt about faraway countries or strange objects or animals. Now we can just go on the internet, it's much easier. But then he 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 had collections. I remember as a child going to, when I um, stayed at Woodstock Terrace, there was a room um, on the first floor at the back of the house, which would have been by the bathroom then, before you went out into into the into the garden. And this room was filled with boxes and files. And I remember then as a child, I used to spend hours in there, never knowing, just opening things up, never knowing what you're going to find. And sometimes it would be glass cased tarantulas, which are quite frightening. Um, but also um, just um, objects, um, which sometimes, well, he, he did label some of them, but sometimes you weren't really sure what they were, what they were for. He was also, there was an enormous amount of China, and somebody once said to me, oh, it's, it's the best possible China, but in the worst possible condition. And I think he, he, again, I think he went round buying things up and thinking he could mend them, as we all do. You know, one day you're going to get around to it. And I don't, maybe he did for some things, but not for everything. So there were sort of pot lids or, you know, vases which were, didn't have handles and other things like that which would have been pretty if they were in complete condition but he he stored all this so what he was what he was hoping to do with it we will never know but i suppose one day he thought when he retired you know he'd he'd have the time which is what you always think and then he never did 
and and there's a record that his his wife said you know what's going to happen to all this if anything happens to you before before me um and she died first and i i think it was about um 10 months before he he did um but it got passed down this whole all these collections got passed down to um my auntie gladys who carried on living at the address in woodstock terrace and then when um, she moved, she moved out to Leon C later in life. She married sort of when she was in her 60s and she moved to Leon C. And at that stage, obviously, she did, you know, didn't need all these things. So um, I remember going, my mother, father, and my sister and I as a family, we hired a van and we kept going to and from rescuing as much of this um, collection as possible. Um, my parents then stored it in various sheds and in the garage and everywhere for many years in their house and then my parents died um, in 2005 and 2006 um, and it literally took us a year to clear the house and everything in it because there was just so much stuff there were hundreds of books just stored but most things weren't in very good condition I'm afraid they'd been stored in the sheds in the bottom of the garden at Woodstock Terrace. They'd had, you know, rats, mice, water damage. Them, um, I mean, things presumably had been damaged in the war, and um, if they hadn't been destroyed, they were damaged. And then when they came to my parents, some of the stuff again wasn't always kept under the best of conditions, and so we had to make that difficult decision that again we couldn't keep everything, you know, the the volume of it. So, um, you know, lots of stuff had to be skipped, I'm afraid. Lots of, you know, things that I think are 17th century books and all that, but they were in terrible, terrible condition. Um, and then um, I've now, you know, kept things. And again, I'm trying to find the time to go through and see what's important and what isn't. But it's, uh, it's you know, this is why I think it's important to have you know for the library to have things to have his um photographs his negatives so that pe more people can use them they can be accessible rather than they sit in around in boxes you know locked away somewhere and people don't know that they exist and and i'm hoping you know it, it'll help interest in him but also help people know more about the east end at that sort of particular time you know from from the turn of the century onwards when he was when he was taking photographs. That's really interesting um, and as you mentioned before that William Whiffen was not only photographing and working um, carrying on this photography business concerned with the day-to-day -day, he was very much concerned with the future and taking a record and that this would be preserved and made available um, and he actually donated mm. a lot of photographs in his own lifetime um, for free which were given to um, the local libraries so popular libraries and also to um, I was about to say Museum of London but it would have been probably Guildhall Library and the collections now held by London Metropolitan Archives um, it's interesting that your family since then have kind of, you know, you felt a responsibility to honour um, his, almost like his ethos in that, to keep on, mm -hmm. like your instinct wasn't whenever this material is passed to you, oh, maybe I should just destroy all of this, if very much, mm -hmm. do you think that's something that has been kind of carried on, this kind of legacy yes. of, no, of his definitely. work and his belief? Yes, in, in, in I, think, I think all of his children, um, Gladys, Sid and Ella were very, very proud of him and his work. I, I've read a letter recently um, from Sid's wife, because Sid went off in um, the war to like, Abyssinia, then he lived in Kenya and Australia, so he, he uh, or Africa and Australia, and he never, he never did come back. Well, he came back to visit several times. Did he ever um, undertake photography as a profession himself? No, he didn't. He was... Um, he was very lazy at school, which he admits to. <laughs> he went to George Green's school and uh, he just mucked about. He wasn't really interested in school. But what he was interested in was mechanics and tinkering. And he went into sort of tinkering with cars. He could sort of take a whole engine apart and put it together again, which was, I don't think my, 
I don't get the sense my grandfather was practical in that way. Um, he, you know, he was more artistic, but Sib went another way. But he did take lots of photos. Um, maybe that was to do with travelling um, and be, being in different, you know, living in different countries. But he did take an enormous amount of photos, which I've got some copies of. But I think, you know, after he died, they they probably I don't know where they've gone. They were destroyed. Gladys, um, she travelled a lot um, uh, in her lifetime. She she went everywhere. She was constantly travelling, and took slides because she gave talks to the you know women's institute, the guild, the the church, the whatever. She you know she came back and and did all these talks. So I've got some of those. Uh, my mother my mother didn't really take photographs. Um, so it hasn't followed on because the other thing I suppose to say is that. William Whiffin's father, who was William Whiffin as well, was a photographer. William's brother, Ernest Whiffin, was also a photographer. And um, they had a studio together in King's Cross. And I think then William um, had sold the sold that to him when he moved, um, he moved into Poplar. Uh, I think they did own several studios at that stage um, in, in eastern North London. But um, Ernest carried on doing that work um, as a photographer as well. So, so it, it, it did show up in other members of the family. And um, I was thinking about that actually, because it's interesting that he came from a family of photographers, but they hadn't seemed to have kind of embraced photography, maybe in, in the same way that um, William Whiffin, right. well, I call him William Whiffin Jr. So his father um, had joined um, his uncle in East India Dock Road to um, work in the photographic studio. And he actually took on the studio himself, William Whiffin Sr. For a sh but it was only for a short period of time. So he seems to not really have wanted to carry on maybe leading that though I, I do understand that he did whenever his son William Whiffin that we're talking about um, opened his studios that his father was still in the support role but he didn't have this same kind of desire to to keep on the business that's that's what I've um, read that my auntie talked about she said of oh, um William Whiffin Senior wasn't interested, which I'm, I'm not completely sure what it meant, but it could mean what you say is he did it as a job, but he didn't have such a passion for it. I think that that's the thing that stands out about my grandfather, um, that he he did. I think he was interested in, in, in people and buildings and, like we said, uh, you know, recording um, the events and 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 buildings that weren't going to be there. And I think there was one point then um, after the war when he actually offered to, um, um, I don't know what it would, it would probably tower, would it be Tower Hamlets then or Poplar Council, to go and take photos, A, of bomb damage, but B, of the new buildings that were going up. So in the 50s, all the new building that was taking place is, uh, you know, after they cleared the bomb sites and everything like that. So I think, and that he was coming then, he died in 1957, so he was coming to the end of his, not that he knew that obviously, at the end of his life, um, but he continued doing that. And I, again, I suppose it was important development, which is sometimes difficult, isn't it, for us nowadays? It isn't until you look back and you see that it was a turning point. It's like the you know, demise of the docks. You you probably wouldn't have necessarily have known that until it happened. Um, and he did to you know, he did do some pictures of the docks. He's got permits about going in there um, and, and taking pictures. But, um, and that would then affect really, um, you know, it would affect trade for him um, if, you know, there weren't so many workers available in the area. But I think obviously he'd, he'd retired um, in, the, in, the, in the early 50s. And that's when he started to give to catalogue some things and, and give things away and I think he did give things to the Museum of London there was also collections I think my auntie gave my auntie Gladys 
to the Jeffrey Museum because he had dolls, you know, as, as part of this collection. He had some sort of dolls or toys. Um, so that's the Jeffrey Museum in Hackney? In Hackney, in yes. Dalton, yeah. yes. And I think other places that, you know, again, if they accepted them, that if they would have been of interest. So he was probably conscious then that, again, you know, that they needed to you know, needed to be available to people and they were, you know, if they were relevant for them. And I just, again, I just, I would like to think that I'm doing what he would have done if he'd have carried on, you know, and going through all of his collections and um, photographs. Uh, and again, you know, if they're stored in boxes, in sheds, in attics, you know, people, people can't have access to them. Whereas through Tower Hamlet's local history library, hopefully people can, you know, can see them and and they can hopefully help towards other people's sort of research into their families or into life, you know, at the East End of a certain in a certain point in time. Thinking about his photography, do you have um, particular favourites? I know that's very difficult because he's got such an immense kind of body of work to choose from. But I know with the exhibition, you definitely had in mind some images that stood out mm. for you. I don't know if you want to talk a wee bit about yes, those. Yes, I think a couple of them are, if you know his work or have seen some of it, are very well known. But I still think, you know, they're quite iconic images um, and I love them. One is the Milverton, which was the ship, the ship's, I don't know if it's the sp is it spite or the bow the first the thump bit of it um, sticking over Manchester Road I believe it is um, and there is a sort of series that I've seen of there's this man um, high up on the on the um, tip of the ship working um, over this sort of road where the the carts are, are going along and so it's the juxtaposition of, of that which I think is quite striking but there's a series of them where the man is at different stages <laughs> he's sort of halfway down or he's right at the end of it um, and I particularly love that because it's something you wouldn't ever see today <laughs> with um, um, the, the ships that sort of you know those sort of those types of ships that came into the docks there's also um, the ones of the boys um, following the water cart which I think was in Cotton Street is it Cotton Street? Um, it may have been in Cotton Street. But um, I think there was speculation whether he set that up, but um, who knows? Uh, but it, it makes a good picture with the, they're sort of laying the dust with the um, water coming out the back of the cart, but all the kids are sort of uh, running alongside, you know, getting wet and uh, thoroughly enjoying themselves, having a great time. Uh, entertainment for free in those days. Even if he did set up the photograph, I... I guess he must have had a certain rapport and this is something that I definitely think comes across in his photographs. He definitely had a rapport with the people when there's people included in his photographs with those people because it, it I guess it wouldn't necessarily be easy to just say, right, do this and no. he must have had a yeah. kind of um, I mean, he, a way yes. about him. That's... He may he may have known them. They were local, yeah. to, local kids. He may have known them or some of them, whatever. Um, they may have been doing it anyway and and he just sort of said oh do you mind doing that again you know for for me I mean that's what that's what photographers professional photographers do now and press photographers I know and they you know they you have to stage things sometimes because you've missed the moment you know and it makes a better photograph um the other pictures I like are um I think I, this is in the exhibition is the one of the hay carts mm. um I think that it was that in Whitechapel, going along Whitechapel. Whitechapel, I mean, High Street. Yes, yes. For, to the Hay Market, which is something obviously you still, <laughs> definitely you wouldn't see today, even though you know it's a it's a hive of uh, commercial activity still. Um, and again, it's just you know seen from a different time. And there was a couple of pictures that there wouldn't be in the exhibition, but that he took. He took, and I think he was sort of. Um, trying out some things on the embankment, you know, of an evening with the Houses of Parliament in the background and um, other sort of scenes in the countryside. There's something he took, which is um, an old cart horse with a man, um, you know, and it, I think he's labelled it end of the day. And it, again, he probably liked that, you know, liked the thought of the, this countryside image, but also he saw it as something that could be used as an illustration in a, in a publication. So he could either offer that, or if people were looking for certain pictures, he, 
you know, he, he had those sort of stock images, but it's, you know, it's a man on a cart horse coming through a sort of um, gate at the end of the day, coming home after a hard day's work. And it's quite evocative, I think, of, of you know, the countryside at that time and the slower, slower pace of life. You mentioned to me before we started the interview that your mother had a series of diaries. Um, how much would they kind of record um, aspects of William Whiffin's life or her relationship with him? Um, I haven't read through them all. She she kept diaries from when she was a young girl and um, most of them seemed to about, be about her um, social life which in London she was just going out, it seemed to be every single night, um, she was out going to the theatre or the cinema or dancing. Um, and when she went back to, her, when she was living in Woodstock Terrace as a young girl, when she went home, she seemed to mainly to wash her hair or do her washing. Um, I, I haven't read a lot about her, her parents in them. One thing she does document, which would be quite interesting, is um, his death, William Whiffin's death. She obviously, um, I can't recall all the details now, but he obviously um, presumably had a stroke and he was quite ill. She was, she was not living at home then, she was contacted. Um, and I think he went to Poplar Hospital where he, he'd actually been made a life governor for his work for Poplar Hospital. He was made a life governor of the hospital. So he had close connections with it. But I think you know several. There were several days after that he wasn't good, but you know, and then he did pass away. So she does document that. Um, but there's letters she wrote when um, in the war. Uh, my mother went to. I think she went down to Bournemouth. She she was a sort of PT, a physical um, training instructor, instructress, um, and she went to Bournemouth. She served there, but then she was sent to Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka. Um, so she was there and she used to send my grandfather, William Whiffin, she used to send him um, packages, which are, some of which I still have, of, you know, of, of tea, of packages or, or the, he liked the, he liked the wrappings of things or the labels. He was, he's, um, so she used to send him things from there or unusual seeds or which we probably couldn't do nowadays or, or various things like that. And I think he, he, he used to ask people. Um, when they went away, you know, to anything of interest to him, and they used to send him um, parcels back. So um, I don't recall a great deal of detail about her writing about them, but it, maybe I haven't found it yet. So um, I can uh, look through a bit more because, um, as I say, most of it, I suppose, when you're younger, is about you, <laughs> more about that. Um, the other thing. To mention about him going back to his like collections and people sending him things. Um, one significant thing that w happened in the um, 1920s, I it took place in 1924 and 1925, was the um, Empire British Empire exhibition, which took place at Wembley, um, and it's on the site where now where Wembley Stadium is. And he obviously visited um, at least a couple of times. I've got the ticket stubs that they were. They went there and he took photographs of that um, while he was there but um, he then either at the exhibitions um, bought objects or, or posters or, um, or like you get brochures or flyers for things now you know advertising flyers or afterwards um, I think what he did was he wrote to a lot of the stands and they represented like countries across the world and I suppose then it would have been quite exciting and exotic, you know, these things from New Zealand or um, uh, different parts of Africa or the, the Caribbean. And he wrote off to, it seemed to be a lot of the exhibitors, um, to send him posters or booklets or, or um, samples of things. There was something I came across once which was all in little files and they had, it was metals or sto bits of stone or other things. And one of them was asbestos in a little file. So, they, <laughs> you know, it was like different bits of, showing different bits of chalk or stone or other things like that. So um, 
so there was a, a lot of things from there and lot, as I say a lot of posters what he was going to do with them because they were quite large posters I you know again I don't know because he didn't exhibit them but I think it was probably having them that was in that was very important to him he also went um I think was it 51 the um the the exhibition on the south bank that they had after the war uh, with, with the, with the festival, of yeah, Britain. the festival of Britain exhibition, and and with the Skylon and all these different other things, and again he went and I've got, he they were more like little snapshot pictures, so presumably he had a more portable camera at that stage, um, but he took pictures of when he visited there, and again he was fascinated and and kept, um, lots of the um, booklets and brochures and other things about it, and again I've got boxes of those. <laughs> Um, and I think he was just, you know, really interested and in whether he'd read them all or was going to read them. But, you know, he was just interested in, in everything in the world. Did your mother tell you many stories about him? Not really. She didn't speak a great deal. As I say, the one thing she she that stood out that she did say that he he you know he would never make much money because he would do so many things for, you know as a favor for people and he liked doing that um but i think she was you know very fond of him but i think it was probably if you think that she left home in her 20s um and and went back a lot to poplar to visit him or, or her parents and, and gladys who lived there um, she did go, but I think she then started, you know, she was a young girl, she had her own life, she worked in the city um, and um, was just having a good time. And then uh, in the fifth, in 1950, she married and then she had my sister and I and, and obviously was sort of very involved in that, um, you know, her family life. And, and she was then living sort of 20, 25 miles away. And as I say, they, you know, definitely kept in touch and definitely saw each other. But I think, you know, she, I didn't ask her about it, which is something that is, you know, I think happens to most people that when you, when, when your parents are alive or your grandparents, you don't think to ask them a lot of sort of factual information. It's just what you glean as a child, isn't it? And hear about that, that you, you remember and recall and you wish you'd asked more. And you told me when we first met that now you would often um, Google your grandfather's name just to see what's kind of out there on the internet. Yes. And yes, I, I one well one reason was, um, but obviously with the advent of eBay and that sort of thing, people have started selling um, pictures of his, like the cabinet pictures that they took, which were were sort of cardboard backed with his. Um, an engraving of of his business name and an address on it so um that was of sort of interest because obviously there were pictures of children or married couple you know of couples or people before they um you know dressed in uniform or that sort of thing um and they they turn up from time to time so i was interested to see that and then at one stage um i had the idea that i'd write to um tower hamlet's council and asked them uh, because of um, all the work that he'd done and, and the time he'd, he'd, he'd lived in the borough, whether they would name um, a road or consider naming a road or something uh, you know, after him. Um, and I put together a sort of biographical sheet for them um, to back it up and um, copies of some of his pictures and sent that. Um, and they said, they would consider it which was you know very nice and I didn't expect much else to happen and then sometime after that it was only when I'd googled his name and I found there was a William Whiffin Square and they hadn't actually told me mm. I, that they were they were doing it but it, that didn't matter um, so uh, I think it, it's off Bow Common Lane um, so quite Bow. close to here you yes. went there today didn't yes you? I went there uh, I went to try and find it a while ago um, and I, I couldn't, uh, I think probably mainly because we were driving around, but this time I went on foot and I did find it, which was, um, you know, very, very exciting really to see his, his name up there. But I don't know if people live, people living there really <laughs> know why, why it's called that, but uh, they can find out more, you know, more about him. 
maybe with the yes, exhibition. With the exhibition, we're doing, yes, yes. They'll be like, "Oh, I live in William." Yes, if we can, way. if we can tell them it's happening. So, I mean, that was very nice because what I'd suggested is, you know, somewhere that he'd had worked and 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 lived, um, you know, could could bear his name. So I think he'd be very very excited about that. Very chuffed. So it's very it's a it's a very nice tribute to him. So thank you to the council. Is there anything else that you wanted to kind of talk about in relation to your grandfather? Or? Um, I think one other thing to say is that his his father had, um, I think, originally come from Bedford and moved into London, um, presumably uh, for work. You know, there was more chance of working of. of you know, more people uh, in London and more work. Um, then his son, uh, this William Whiffin, had helped him in the studio and then obviously had taken over and, and had got other studios in London. At one point, I think they lived in, in Kensal Green um, in northwest London. But then he made the move into Poplar and it seemed to be the connection was... Um, his uncle Thomas Wright <coughs> um, had 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 moved to Poplar, and he was a photographer. The, I wasn't. I didn't know of that. I think because I knew him when I'd seen things. He was a um, an out. He was an outfitters. He, he ran an outfitters in military uniform, and I, I think that may have been in East India Dock Road as well. But presumably that might have been the connection that he he was working there, and he. He ran a photographic studio at that time and that's why they moved there but I suppose the one thing that stands out is that William Whiffin Jr always then stayed in Poplar he stayed all his life and he when never thought of as far as I'm aware never thought of moving out his father um, I think went he went to Hackney and then he ended up in um, Westcliff on Sea near South End which I'm, I'm, I'm sure, you know, a lot of East Enders at, at that time, and I knew that when I visited, you know, they, they really aspired to moving out. And I suppose it was not that they didn't like Poplar or the area, but I suppose it was a bitty, busy, at that stage, dirty city. And you wanted to, what they saw is moving more into the, you know, for your retirement, moving into the countryside and that sort of thing. So his father had moved out. Um, as I said, my auntie, who who lived in Poplar all her life, she went to um, uh, Bromley by Bow when she married to a flat there, and then they were um, keen to again move out, and they they ended up in Leoncey near South End. Um, at the you know towards the end of her life, she she lived in a flat there, but that's one thing I think I'd never heard or read about that he would have wanted to move at all. He you know his life was Poplar. Once he once he'd gone there, um, and he he very much stayed there. And it's interesting. Something that I find on ancestry mm. uh, and the census, I think yeah. it was the census, or it might have been birth, marriage, and death mm. records, was that William Whiffin's mother, so William w- Whiffin Senior's wife, Ellen Farley, she was born in Shadwell. So there was right. the connection on the maternal side as as well as the on his father's side yeah. because i'd always wondered my grandfather's wife who was called minnie duck um i discovered fairly recently that she lived in um uh, hammersmith and i went to actually see the house which is still there just um off of uh, just by hammersmith bridge the north side of hammersmith bridge and I then started thinking, well, how on earth did, would they have met? You know, it's like one of these other unanswered questions. If, if she was in Hammersmith and he was in East London. But w- what I think is, they in the early 1900s, I've got some programmes from 1901 and 02. He was also uh, something we, we haven't talked about, but he was... Um, my grandfather was very into amateur dramatics and and the family were um and they um they set up um 
1912 because um, lots of our family members um, spread around seemed to have a, 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 a folder of these pictures. They put on, in 1912, they put on a Dickens Christmas, which was a play presumably only for the family, but they took photos, as they were photographers, they took photos of all this, or got somebody to do, but they were all dressed up, and I don't know what was the, you know, whether it was a play or a, uh, just a, some scenes or something, but they put on this Dickens Christmas. And um, so we've all got different sort of, you know, these sets of these photographs. So he was very into amateur dramatics, but when it, so he would have been, what have we he been then, 23? He would have just been in his early 20s and they seem to have um, been part of a sort of dramatic troupe that gave performances. They did at Alexandra Palace, um, various places, because I've got the programmes. Now, the man who put those shows on was one Percy Vincent. And I'm not terribly sure his relationship, but Minnie Duck, his wife, my grandfather's wife, the family changed their name to Vincent because her father, who was Simeon William Duck, who lived in Hammersmith, was an undertaker. And I think it was not seen seemly for an undertaker to have the name of Duck. So they changed their name to Vincent. Now, this Percy Vincent put on the plays and there was a Miss Vincent and a Mr Whiffin who did some duets together. Mm. And I think that's how they must have come together. And I, I, I don't know how they knew each other, but maybe in those sort of circles. That's how I like to think they met and fell in love <laughs> and married. And they married, um, I think according to the marriage certificate, that was in St. James's Church in Clapton. Yes, in Clapton, Hackney. yes. I think they met, was it 1904 they married? That's what I've and, got yes, noticed. I've yeah. got the marriage certificate. Yeah. They, they married in 1904, and what doesn't seem to be documented is they had a son in 1906 called, I think he was called Edward, who died as an infant. And I've tried, uh, one story my mother did tell me, but I can't substantiate it, is that, but I do know they were living in Kensal Green, and, and my mother thinks he was buried in Kensal Green Cemetery. But my grandmother, who gave birth to him, had been so ill, I don't know why, whether it's, it's complications or, or she just was ill, she was so ill, but it was said that she watched from the window as his, his funeral his, or his coffin, you know, passed by. But I've been to that cemetery and I can't trace any record of anything. They do say, though, um, as I say, it was 1906, uh, um, and I think he was, he was only a few months old, but they say that, that he may have been buried, you know, when they'd opened a grave and were, were going to do an adult burial and just be put in there, so there may be no, no, no trace of him, but there, there don't seem to be any records. So they'd had a son early on. Then there was another four years, because my auntie, I think, was born in 1908, Gladys, and she was much older because Sid was then 1917 and my mother was 1921. So there was some, some you know, gaps. Um, and that's why Gladys was much older than the, the rest of them. And she she was presumably old enough to help out in the, in the photography business. One thing um, I do recall her saying, that she used to tint the photos before the advent of colour photography. Um, and I've got some sort of notes and I think he he must have come back from a wedding and he would have then written down that the bridesmaids you know had you know pale green dresses or the the, the headdress was a pink or the flowers were something you know blue and white and she used to hand tint some of the the pictures so um and I I've I have got at least one um tinted picture that I I would hope that she had would have done um are there any um, surviving family photographs then, like that either William Whiffen would have taken of his family, or that he would have been in as well? I assume that yeah. you know he would have, yeah, been he, able to. He was he was quite rarely in pictures. I mean, the, a very funny one I've seen is my uncle Sid, 
obviously he was in army uniform, so it's before he was being sent off somewhere. And this was taken in the um, living room, drawing room of um, in Woodstock Terrace with a mirror up against near the fireplace. He was posed by the fireplace and there's a mirror and reflected in the mirror, you can see my grandfather's head with the camera, which was quite was quite funny to see that. Um, he's very rarely in pictures because presumably he was taking most of them. But but there are family pictures. He was one of seven. Ch he was the eldest of seven children. He had three sisters um, and three brothers. And there's a picture of um, the family with their parents, all, all seven of them with their parents. Uh, which is 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 really nice to see all of them, and um, there's also pictures. He celebrated his um, golden wedding, um, and I think that was at they use Poplar, um, you know, a hall at Poplar. Um, they they had all their presents laid out, and they had all their friends there. So again, him and Minnie were in the in the picture. I don't know who took those pictures, but they're in 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 the pictures of those and I think his his father had celebrated a, a golden wedding as well previously so um, you know there's there's those sort of family events I think they probably didn't take as many photos as, as we would do now um, you know only when they gathered together but again there are some on picnics with my mother as a young girl my mother um, Ella was incredibly close um, best of friends with her cousin who was called Edna um, uh, Whiffin. Edna was the daughter of Ernest Whiffin. Um, they were obviously about the same age and she stayed very, very close to her um, all her life. Uh, they used to go out, as uh, play together as children and go out as young women. Uh, Edna, I think, married much earlier than my mother because my cousins were born in the late 40s. Um, so she married and started a family and she... They, that side of that part of the family from Ernest, I think, were always more biased towards North London because um, Edna and her family always lived in North London, um, so they kept that connection there. That, and as I say, Ernest was a photographer. Yes, as well. yeah, he he was a photographer. I don't know if any of his pictures exist, mm. but I've got pictures of him and 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 his and his wife. I think she was also called Ellen. Um, probably a name of the time wasn't it uh, I was wondering going back to um, Thomas Wright mm. who was the uncle of William Whiffin senior um, you thought that there was a connection perhaps between Thomas Wright who sold his business then to his nephew and then the business ended up being um, run by William Whiffin junior William Whiffin that we're focusing on the exhibition yes. um, because there's photographs that William Whiffin Jr. took of a, a Wright's business on East India Dock Road, and that was listed as William Wright, I think. Do you think, had you um, heard stories or it just made that connection because of the name? I've, well, I've, I think there's a Thomas and there's a William Wright. I'm not, I haven't really researched what, what the connection, but I was always told it was his uncle, one of them was his uncle. Um, and he I always I can't remember which one whether that was a father and son as well because one of them was it Thomas Wright was according to family history he was a balloonist as well mm. which I think some you know people were in those days I suppose you know if they could do it he, he went up several times in a in a balloon I don't know where that would have been <laughs> whether, it, whether it was over the river or or somewhere you know away but there is a family connection. And the other story is that through this Wright connection, through a lady called Bessie Wright, and again, I don't know how she's related, that, that we were, the family were related to the Wright brothers in America who, who did the first flight in North Carolina. And strangely enough, um, I now have relatives through my partner who live in North Carolina. So I have been there. But, That's a uh, small world. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, but I, I, I suppose you know, if if more research is done, we can make that you know make those other connections. But I suppose it would be that you wouldn't just probably turn up somewhere without without having some connection in an area. You know, you would have a 
a friend or a relative or or knows you know or you go because you've got an offer of work and I think it was probably that that if he if he had an interest in photography he he, he went to you know see his uncle and he saw that there was you know a lot of opportunity in in Poplar in the area at that time. You mentioned before that your grandfather he obviously had his interest in photography and his business as a photographer but he also had interest in painting and in amateur dramatics. Did he did you ever hear if he had any interest in the moving image so in making films perhaps himself or is that the- wasn't the only thing I know about that is he did actually, I've still got, he kept, he did keep lots of celluloid, but I, again, I don't know how he got it. Um, and, and some of it quite large celluloid from, from, you know, feature films and others are sort of, um, um, you know, single, single shots of, you know, it's like stuff that ends up on the cutting room th- floor. And I suppose that was sort of sold off or, you know, could be, could be bought then. And also, he did he did collect photos from I've I found recently a box like from um, MGM Studios or and, and one of the other um, movie studios of, of people that wouldn't really really be familiar to us now, but presumably they were sort of film stars. So I think you know my understanding would be that he was interested in anything anything artistic really, and I you know not just from the fact that it, you know it's interesting to go to the and see a film at the cinema but it was you know how it was made and, and still the process because he he did have like photographic magazines and other things that he cut out that, that, that I've seen you know and it, again it was you know or the latest development in 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 photography or, or things like that so you know I think I you know I just think he must have been of an artistic sort of nature and liked all those all those things. I find um, the more I learn about William Whiffen, the more um, I'm enamoured by the, his personality and his career. And it's just, he just seems like such an interesting person, really. Do you find that, um, like, for instance, at the Tower Hamlet's local history library, there was an exhibition of his work, what would have been about 40 years ago in the 1970s? Mm-hmm. And now we're building up to another exhibition. Um, what do you think it is about his work? Because perhaps he wouldn't really have been, um, uh, we're not like a worldwide known figure during his life and after. But there's a certain kind of um, characteristic that his work has kind of lasted and has this enduring kind of quality. I don't know if if you've any thoughts on on. Well, I, I suppose I'm biased. One is I'm I'm incredibly proud of him, and and I've always thought that his work is is really good but I think well is that just because I'm you know I've you know rose tinted spectacles sort of thing but I you know I have read some reviews from other people who say it, it is good I suppose I'm not aware that there's a lot of material that's unusable but I suppose in those days you see you you I mean I admire him because in those days you had one chance of getting po- photos, really, and you, you, you know, you had these sort of very um, heavy, laborious cameras and all the different sort of equipment. And actually, to get some of the images that he's got, and he, when he, uh, one thing I always think when he took, you know, quite large groups of children or street parties or you know um, gatherings of people. Sometimes that you know people have obviously haven't held position and they've looked away and they are a bit blurred. But I mean. Out of say fifty people, you know, forty-five are fine, or so, you know, something like that. And it must have been, it must have been quite a challenge. So I think, I mean, I suppose he did it for a long time, and and he knew what to expect. But um, I think, you know, he he probably did have the right um, sort of, you know, demeanour to to take, you know, to deal with people. Um, who may be uncomfortable, might not be used to having photos taken, or an unruly bunch of people to, to get together. Um, may, maybe he pref- that's why he preferred to take buildings; <laughs> they were static. But um, uh, no, I, I'm really, really, really proud of him, and I, I, I hope that you know his work will endure, and more people can see it and and be aware of it uh, through the exhibition and through publicity about it, and. And as I say, 
hopefully it, it also helps because I know he did there's an awful lot of his, his commercial work and in, in, um, wedding photography that that it would be very difficult now if they're not marked, you know, to identify who they are. But it'd be lovely to know that some families are, are sort of reunited with, with, you know, their history through photos he's taken. And we haven't really talked that much about that side of the business, but that would have been really the bread and butter, the portrait work, so yeah. weddings... Yeah. Um, what else would people have just come in for a photograph of a special family occasion or yeah well my my understanding was um he he used to keep things on slips of paper and and once I found these and I put them together and it but it's only half of like his price list which was <laughs> which was interesting, but they had some these this thing called cabinet photos, which were i think were they the larger ones, but they were on you know card backed. Or you've got smaller pictures, obviously, that you could carry about in a, in a wallet or a bag. And um, they had a club. Um, I'm sure most photographers did this. But you paid into this club um, a small amount of money. And then, obviously, you could use that to to buy, you know, certain images. Um, and I think it was... I mean, A, people are in uniform, so presumably they may be, you know, before they go off to war or they've come home on leave and you want to take an image of your son or whatever but they, they were family groups they were children um he he had from from looking at the pictures um they had these great big backdrops in the studio presumably i mean very theatrical again uh painted backdrops um or they may have been some sort of wall hangings like tapestries because i have got some of those still um and so they had different scenes put out of the back so it could be as if you were on a terrace looking out onto a beautiful garden or you know some other sort of um, classical sort of scene and that was used as the backdrop and then you had sort of props so you had um, a sort of tallish stand or table so somebody could sort of lean on that so out of interest otherwise I think people couldn't just sort of stand there they'd feel very awkward and and one of the things um, he used, which is in a lot of the photos. I've seen my auntie Gladys um, seated, seated, on, seated on it um, and some of his other subjects. And it's known, I've looked it up, it's a Savonarola chair and it's like a crossover chair, a sort of um, a cross chair, a lowish chair. And strangely enough, I have that chair. Um, it was something I can't remember where we found it, but we've got it. And the bottom bit has, the, the feet things have rotted. but And it's very, very heavy. I don't know what sort of wood. It's wood and painted. Um, but it's very solid, which I suppose it, it you know needed to be in the studio. But I, I'm quite pleased that I've still got that and I want to have it restored. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do, <laughs> where I'm going to put it and what I'm going to do with it. But that that is in several of his photographs. So they had these sort of chairs or stands or, you know, depending on how many people might be in a picture or how young or old they were. But I think it was one is to make a make them more comfortable and be um, keep them keep them still, presumably, because I think I think there were lots of pictures um, right in early stages where you had some contraption at the back of your head, some sort of um, holding your head still because the exposure was so long. Um, in the early stages of photography that you had to keep very still otherwise the image wouldn't come out sharp enough but um, so I like to think that you know his his love of the theatre helped him in his in his photography um, but definitely the bread and butter would have been of the commercial business would have been you know people wanting a, a photo of, as, of their children or they just got married um, or they were going, you know, just got engaged or something like that. I, and I think probably even in that day and age, it, you know, even though to us it would have been a small amount of money, it was still quite an outlay then. But, you know, that was your option because you didn't have your own, you know, camera. You did go along to a photographer. And I I'm, I'm, you know, I know he was one of many in, in, the, in the area. So there were, you know, a lot of photographers serving, serving that area. Um, and people having pictures which are you know as, as I say they do turn up on eBay so they do survive till today so do you know with the wedding photographs would it would they have actually been taken on the day or would they have maybe been taken like before or after the actual wedding like they would have come along and put on all their 
from, refinery. From what I've seen, it looks like they were taken. They were taken on the day because some of them have got the the minister or the priest in them. Some of them, you know, they they they're not just the couple. They've got obviously their um, parents or their you know the bridesmaids or whoever around them. But some of them seem to have been taken at like it looks like like a back alley by the church and and very interesting they've put a they've put a bit of carpet or rug down to make it, to make it look a bit better and um uh but i mean they're just very striking of you know the 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 dress in those days and the flowers and, and you know what they were wearing and how smart they looked because you know presumably maybe some of them people weren't used to wearing suits and dressing up in their finery um so again, I like to think that you know he could put them at their ease. He he did take there's some lovely sets of uh, my mother's wedding. My mother got married at um, All Saints Church in Poplar, Poplar yeah. but she had her photos done at St Matthias's, which is now it's yeah, a community centre. I think I did visit some time ago, and and it, I I mean it's the church in the um, near Poplar Rec. Popular. popular recreation ground which was opposite where they lived in Woodstock Terrace because I, I remember when I visited there I would always go and play on the swings I loved playing on those swings I still love swings today it must have been, come from that and um, but I'm, I'm too old and big now to get on them and never too old for <laughs> swings <laughs> no, I did try um, but uh, and I did go and visit there and, and, and take some photos myself but she had a I don't know why um they they thought it was a better setting but they she he took my mother's wedding photos and they're b- beautiful and i've still got my mother's wedding dress which was a, a oh. cream crepe number and i've still got her headdress and her um i don't know if it's a bouquet but it was like waxed flowers you had these waxed flower things um so i've i've come across that as well that i I've, they've kept so they were a family yeah. what we'd now modern day call holders <laughs> They'd call themselves collectors, but uh, uh, I think they collected, and but as I say, without any sort of view to what was going to be done with it. But you know, it's fortunate that it does still exist. And that's really interesting that um, she chose Saint Matthias like that that back mm. farm because, as you say, it's right beside Poplar Recreation Ground, and and I can think of some of the most striking photographs that we have that William Whiffen took or of the Upper North Street oh, yes. school, the memorial, yes. so obviously the, the death of mm. the, the school children mm. due to bombing. And so that whole kind of area there, and you, you've got that East India Dock Road and Woodstock Terrace and you know, popular Methodist churches to be on the corner. You can almost, you know, build up this picture of this particular kind of plot, this particular area of popular that had a lot of significance for... William Whiffen and his family. Yes, I mean he mu- he must have known the area like the back of his hand, mm. really. Um, and I've got letters from that that are posted, which we find extraordinary today. That would have been posted like in the morning that he got that same day, and he replied to, and it may have been from um, Sister Mary from somewhere saying, "Oh, we're having our you know confirmation this afternoon. Can you come?" And do the photographs and things like that, and it obviously, you know, the communication was strangely enough, but you know, through the postal system, much better than it might be today. And um, but I think I think he'd embrace things like email. I can imagine him embracing, you know, digital photography and uh, email and everything like that because I think he he was just generally interested in in, in science and and the progress of things. So that was something I was going to ask you actually as. Uh one of our kind of um, final questions. Um, If he was alive today, what do you think that your grandfather would be working in? Or what, you know, do do you have any kind of, does any images kind of spring to mind? I I suspect he would still be, um, he'd probably be absolutely fascinated about the change of the docks and the change of the use of the docks and how all of that development took place. Um, and I think you know a genuine wonderment and fascination at it not thinking oh you know it should still be docks and there should still be all this going on 
he would have hopefully seen it as 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 the next stage in the progress and that and that you know thank goodness it's it is being used and and it has a different use nowadays um i mean i think you know some sadness for for the the way of life and how it changed but I, again i hoped that he would probably be still documenting the the changing face of london and hopefully the east end of london well that's um that's brilliant thanks so much is there anything any final comments you'd like like to add i don't think so i think we've covered most things there was something i'm just remembering now that you said that when you um came across his images be that in publications or online would you find that often they weren't actually referenced as being by your grandfather yes yes. no that's yeah that is quite important I I look. I'm forever in charity shops and <laughs> and other bookshops and things. And if I see an old book about London, um, I always look. I stand there looking up in the in the back in case there's anything. Um, um, and a lot of times it says um, Tower Hamlets Local History Library. And I I mean some of the photos I do know, and they definitely are his. Others I sort of think they may be his. But I think what I would like is to know that, you know, in future he will be given a personal credit because I think it's useful to know that, not just for, you know, my benefit or his benefit, but but it would be useful to know that he was, you know, the the author of these pictures, um, specific ones. And I think, you know, I, I want to keep his name alive, really. And that's one main reason. I mean, recently I went into... A, I, I now live in Hertfordshire and I went into an Oxfam bookshop and came across two volumes of Wonderful London, which is, they used a lot, a lot of his pictures in them. And even now on eBay, they sell the pages from that book. Mm. I can't, I don't know who's, who's doing it and they never seem to, I don't know, they don't seem to get rid of them, but um, they're the pages cut out of those books of his pictures because I was quite excited because it's a William Whiffin you know, photograph, and then, and then I realised the page, they're from this book, and that, luckily they, these books weren't very I don't know, about fourteen pounds or something. But I just snapped them up because I have got a set that my auntie had and passed down, and my, I think my uncle in Australia sent back many uh, books with whiffing um, pictures or or about Poplar. He sent them back from Aust- or they got sent back after he died from Australia. Um, but I'm, I'm, as I say, I'm forever still searching, um, and I'm, I'm really pleased and happy when they when they are used. And I think one one the most recent use I know is Peter, one of Peter Ackroyd's books about London, and he used this isn't popular, but he used um, um, or he referred to William Whiffin, and I was very surprised to see it there, um, and it was at um, a, a mural of. I think it was the boys following the water cart at Lambeth Walk, but I then went down there um, to have a look and um, got talking to some, I couldn't see it at all, and got talking to a man in, um, a very friendly man in a, a fish and chip shop opposite who said, it's all been knocked down and there's flats there now. Oh. So it's no look, but it was there, that's fine. It was there, so some you know people did see it at one point, so that was nice. Have but, you been back along to... Um, East India Dock Road have you walked down kind of around that area to kind of look at the sites where his studio would have been based yes. and where his father yes. and his uh, yeah. well I, I have been uncle. I have been back but it's obviously changed quite a lot and I've tried to look for you know all the places that they had their studio and they lived and I've I've been back to Woodstock Terrace and um, seen how much the property prices are now <laughs> She's. At, I think yeah. They would have been. They rented. They rented the places that they stayed in, and I've still got their rent books. And um, there's one from when would it have been nineteen nineteen twenties probably. They paid twelve shillings a week. And when they, oh, one thing we haven't covered, um, I could just talk about briefly. In the nineteen thirties, obviously there was the depression. Um, I've come across um, an envelope full of letters and it was marked South End Letters and it was when obviously my great grandfather, uh, William Whiffin's father, had moved out um, to near South End and in his retirement um, 
he obviously still owned one of the properties in East India Dock Road that my father, uh, my grandfather used as a studio. And M William Whiffin Jr. had stopped paying the rent. And presumably this was the 30s. He had three youngish children. Maybe, you know, presumably business wasn't that good. Um, the rent wasn't that high, but, but there were gaps in the book and he wasn't, he wasn't paying his rent. And there's a whole correspondence, and I've only got his father's his father's side of it, but the letters get you know increasingly um, imploring him to pay the rent because they are relying on it for their retirement, and they need the money. Um, William Whiffin's sister May appears to have lived with them. She did get married to a policeman called Hills. I don't know what happened. I haven't looked into that yet. Um, and so presumably they may have separated or got divorced because she was living back with her parents in Westcliff on sea and it seems to be that she was working to help you know pay for them and she writes also to my grandfather and i think you know there was obviously a problem between them except that his father's letters all say your dearest dad and from dad you know and not nasty but but it becomes increasingly difficult that he says, you know, I need this money. Uh, if you if you can't pay it, you know, I'm going to have to let it or sell it. The next things I come across are some advertisements in the East London Advertiser for the house for sale. And it was a large, it was their property, but it was a large, which, you know, they are now, but they are shops, I suppose, but a large Georgian property. Um, and he put the price down and I think it got sold for about £100 which you know nowadays we think incredible so that was one of the reasons he probably then moved to whether he moved to Woodstock Terrace then or another place I'm not I haven't gone into the sort of um, chronology of it but um, his father had to sell the property from under him because he wasn't paying the rent but as I say this was the 30s during the depression and it must have been a very very difficult time for him so that could have been because your grandfather was based at two, 237 East mm. India Dock Road and then he moved to smaller premises, 241, so mm. not a great move, just a couple yeah. of doors down. Um, I think that was about 1932 oh, well, it, yeah. well, it would have been so that. So that that's... would have been... The reason why yeah that's when those it was those letters were then it was definitely the early 1930s yep okay that's great i could really talk to you all day <laughs> about um your grandfather and um you've been a really um fascinating interviewee so thank you very much for participating and also obviously for all your help with um making the exhibition happen which hopefully will be a fitting tribute to your grandfather and um, his legacy. Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks.